We can start, right? Okay, we can start. So, uh, dear participants, I'm excited to welcome you to Eurasia's Masterclass today on one of the current top topics in education, management and organizational research, the future skills. Currently, um, we are welcoming about 110 uh, particip participants and we are delighted um, about the lively interest. Um, but first of all, I want to take a moment to introduce myself to you. So, um, I'm um, a P PhD student and a research assistant at the Duale Hochschule in Baden-Württemberg. And I am working on the topic of artificial intelligence and its benefits for increasing diversity among uh, students. And I'm a social scientist um, with a specialization on economics and a freelance writer, translator, editor, and coach. From November um, 2050 until September 2019, I was deputy managing editor at a magazine, a Bay monthly magazine uh, in Berlin for pop culture, politics, and feminism. And in addition, I have been also a member of the management board of an NGO. And since December, I have been part of the research group um, on future skills led by Professor Eder. Today, I'm your moderator, and I, we will spend together the next 90 minutes on one topic, as I already mentioned, the future skills, with one, one speaker that you can already see, Professor Eder. You are, <laughs> you are welcome. Uh, to raise your questions during the debate in the Zoom chat box, or you also have uh, the Q&A box. And I am happy to collect uh, all your questions and then to submit them to Professor Elias. Uh, today, we will be discussing on the hot topic, as already mentioned, of future skills in times of global network organizations and steadily accelerating product cycles, the model of qualification for future jobs seems debatable. Professor Ehlers will present today the results of four years on, of research on this question, whether or if we can really prepare graduates and employees for the future by the predominant model of knowledge acquisition, or do we already have adequate concepts for competence development in higher education and work environment. Further um, webinars or workshops on this topic will follow soon. But now I'm pleased to introduce our today's speaker to you. Uh, today we, we will have the chance to listen and to discuss with one of the key um, <coughs> learning innovation exper experts in Europe, Professor Ela. Um, is an innovation expert, as mentioned, and serial entrepreneur and professor for educational management and lifelong learning at the Baden-Württemberg Cooperative State University in Karlsruhe, where he held the position of the vice president from 2011 until 2017. He's vice president at the European Association for Institutions of Higher Education and also member of the Executive Council uh, of European Distance and e-learning network and he's chairing um, the Bologna advisory group for teaching and learning. He's also advisor to the university president for digital transformation of teaching and learning and for more information you are invited to visit his website ulfelas.net. Now that you have learned a little bit about me and about Professor Elatz, we would like to challenge the group size and also the format here and try to learn more about you. So now we, will, we want to know who is here. And um, for this purpose, a service will be show, small service will be shown to you as we can see the first one here. And you are invited to provide us with some information about our audience today. So please give us a short overview of your back 
of your professional background, please. And Thank then, you for so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool to see so many people logging on the surveys and the numbers going up. That's uh, when I do teaching. When we do teaching, actually, this is always an indication. Are participants asleep? The students or are they actually attentive and listening when you suddenly start a survey and nobody's answering you know <laughs> nobody's listening <laughs> so what we can see here um, i'm going to close this survey now and show you the results here are the results here they are what we can see is we have most of you are education professionals, more than half. That is, for example, teachers or media designers or curriculum designers or quality uh, evaluation uh, professionals. We have some students, five students, and we have uh, policymakers also, 13, and institutional leaders. So it's quite a good, good response, I find. Uh, it would be great if we could get into a debate now, <laughs> because these different perspectives are key to finding good solutions to our complex institutional challenges, I think. Um, <clears throat> what else do we want to know, Patricia? What else do we want to know? So maybe we have to show the next slide. Yeah, right. So how old are you? What is the age group? Okay, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so we can see 95, <clears throat> 99, 100%. 100 people were replying. I show you the results. So we have uh, most of the participants between 50, 41 and 50. And then uh, between the youngers and the olders, uh, it's distributing fairly evenly. That's very interesting. That's exactly my age cohort, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. And what else do we want to know? Let's see. Um, from yes, which we want region? to know where you come from. <laughs> ah, yes, 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 yes. Which region, region are you currently in, attending the webinar from Europe or other regions of the world? Okay, so that's that's uh, absolutely clear. European seminar, European attendance. That's because Eurasia is so well rooted in European countries. I just stop this now and show you the results again. We have one person from Africa. Hello, uh, I would love to know where you come from in Africa. We have three from Asia and one from the Caribbean. Wow, that's really cool. Good to, good to see that. And then let's see, I think we also have a question, where in Europe do you come from? From which member exactly. state? Uh, let's see, we will, okay. Can you, can you see this? You can, yeah. Find your country. <laughs> it's the game. Is it possible? Nobody's answering. So that means it doesn't work somehow. So you have you have different options. There are three sections. And you also have the last option is others. But I think it's not working because nobody is answering the okay. the poll. Ah yeah, nobody. No, somebody has started. Cyprus. We have one from Cyprus. I know somebody from Cyprus. <laughs> okay. And now we have two, four, okay, it's coming through now. Maybe it was a bit difficult to, ah, okay, we have, ah, okay, we have some, four people answer, have answered now, five. Okay, I understand there is a pro problem. Um, <clears throat> you have to check one box at least in each section. Ah, Unless see. you cannot submit the answer. Yeah, yeah, of course. So maybe you have no. to skip <laughs> this part of our <laughs> survey. We have to skip this part. Okay, well, okay, no problem. We will go back to the meeting. Um, 
Where do I find my parts now? Here we are. Okay. And I will stop this. Um, but you did great. You did great Dis despite the difficult question and uh, poll uh, logistics. You did great. Okay. So, and that's it, I think, right? That's it for now. Yeah, that's it for now. Uh huh. That's it for now. So we know a little bit, everybody is from Europe, almost, not just everybody, but almost everybody is from Europe. Uh, we know the age and we know that we have uh, lots of educational professionals, which makes me feel quite like home because this is exactly what I am uh, actually uh, as well. Okay, Patricia, should we start? What do you think? Yes. Please go ahead, Ul. I think right. we are waiting. <laughs> I think I'm going to uh, introduce a bit the masterclass. Thanks for your answers. Um, just going back a quickly, uh, taking a quick glimpse at the um, agenda which we are looking at today. We have uh, actually distributed or separated uh, our masterclass into five parts, five short. Uh, brief talks basically. Uh, in between we have the chance to take questions and uh, we have quite a, a refined questioning tool here so questions and answers uh, will be given. Um, if you have problems with the video or the audio connection you can also let us know in the chat. Uh, of course we cannot react to every single thing there but uh, we try to uh, do it as good as, as possible. Patricia, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, you are also going to take care a little bit about the off the chat and uh, distill the question from us and we try to uh, bring them in here. We're going to spend 90 minutes together. You can see the time framing here on the agenda slide. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about where you find more about our work, future skills in a nutshell, what are we actually uh, looking at. I will then tell you for those who are also interested into um, theory a bit, uh, uh, a short presentation on the context of future skills, setting the scene. Why do we talk about future skills? Uh, we're going to, to have a look at future skills in detail also. Uh, also, I'm going to provide you with a download of our 17 future skill profiles just in uh, three minutes. Um, then we look at the structures behind the future skills because this is a major part of our work, not just to list future skills, uh, to have a list of a compilation list of what is important, but also to see can from an educational point of view, from an educational science point of view, we identify underlying structures there. And we think we can and we um, uh, want to present this to you. Um, and also uh, in part five, we are going to talk a bit uh, about our current view on how well higher education is doing actually. So that's the agenda for today. We have a bit of knowledge about who's here and start with our first chapter. You can say future skills in a nutshell. Um, future skills. Um, is uh, a larger project which is con consisting actually of several um, surveys and studies, a Delphi survey and an, a qualitative interview study uh, and other surveys, expert screenings of organizations. Um, and the end result is um, a website which we created and of course also book publications. And on this website, which you can see here actually, it is nextskills.org, uh, you can find all information uh, of our work. I hope that I'm not demotivating those uh, who are uh, here to listen to uh, our presentations uh, and who might now say, okay, we're going there and downloading everything. But um, still in our presentation today, we try to give some more insight uh, and, and background information than you find there. But still what you can see here actually, and that was important for us to show you, is you can download the 17 future skill profiles here directly on the website if you are interested in them. Um, 
just to familiarize ourselves a little bit with uh, what are we actually talking about when we are talking about uh, future skills, I would like to show you a short video which we uh, created and it's uh, in German but it's subtitled with, uh, with uh, English and I'm going to start the video um, now. Uh, just let me try again to start the video. So let's see. Okay. Okay. Now it should work. Es sind Fähigkeiten wie Design Thinking, Sinnhaftigkeit und Sinnstiftung erzeugen zu können. Die Future Skills von morgen, das sind Fähigkeiten wie ethische Kompetenzen, sich verorten zu können in möglicherweise digital problematischen Szenarien, künstliche Intelligenz einschätzen zu können. Natürlich sind es Digital Literacies, Medienkompetenzen, es sind aber auch die Fähigkeiten, Entscheidungen zu treffen, Verantwortung zu übernehmen. Es sind Fähigkeiten wie Design Thinking, Sinnhaftigkeit und Sinnstiftung erzeugen zu können. Es sind die Fähigkeiten, sich in Organisationen bewegen zu können, in denen immer mehr das Netzwerk die Regel ist und nicht die strategische Hierarchie, in denen immer weniger Vorgegebenes als Anlass für die eigene Arbeit dient und in dem immer mehr Selbstentwicklung und Selbstorganisation geübt und ausgeübt werden muss. 17 Profile und jedes Profil enthält Bezugskompetenzen, sind also gewissermaßen sind diese Profile Container für und Ausgangspunkte, Gravitationszentren für Fähigkeitsportfolios, die Studierende im Rahmen ihrer Studienerfahrung, ihrer Lernerfahrung entwickeln können. Okay, so that's um, a short glimpse into the future skills uh, world a little bit, uh, which we wanted to share with you. We have actually created eight of these videos uh, for different topics of future skills, 90 second uh, videos, and you can um, uh, find them on the website and they are here. Some of them are here, just three of them are here, and uh, have a look at them. Also, you can download our publications there. Um, the most recent publication is the one on future skills, uh, learning of the future and higher education of the future uh, in German uh, with Springer Open Access or in English um, uh, also freely available on the website. Have a look and feel free. We are going to um, have events, workshops now, of course, online workshops as well, um, to, due to a corona situation, um, but uh, also in the further distance, maybe in December or next year, January, February, some live workshops throughout Europe. Uh, and you can find on the website always the current information. Now, enough for um, giving you some, let's say, uh, links and downloads and uh, book resources. Now let's see what are we actually talking about. And to be honest, I thought today, of course, uh, how could it be different to start thinking about uh, the corona situation. And with Corona, what I see with higher education in Germany and in Europe as well is that we are looking at three different stages which we are going or which we are actually going through or are right in the middle of now. Uh, the first one was quite a chaotic uh, stage, quite a chaotic uh, response. Uh, everybody tried to come to terms with um, suddenly taking thousands of students online and thousand higher education institutions had to take thousands of uh, colleagues, professors, lecturers, teachers online 
Um, and that was, uh, in a way, uh, a situation in which everybody uh, did uh, what they can uh, to fulfill uh, the needs which they were seeing in front of them. Um, we are now gradually moving more and more towards a phase in which we are trying to structure our response. So it's a phase of structured response now, uh, and we're starting to uh, see how we can uh, pull together systems, for example, technical systems, how we can also start uh, short and medium term qualification programs for our teachers, uh, how we can uh, bring students into partnerships uh, with our teachers for teaching, how we can uh, build up assessment services. Yeah? Assessment in higher education currently is a nightmare when you cannot allow students to come into the, um, the, uh, the, lectures, the lecture halls and take uh, sit, sitting exams. Um, it's, it's quite difficult and uh, in my university we have started to uh, experiment with portfolio and open book uh, exams and so on and so on, but uh, it's not something where you can immediately say, okay, this is now going to, to work. So, what we are seeing here is actually this phase of structured response is suddenly starting to question the usual way we are doing it, you know, and we know that we are not looking just at a couple of weeks, but rather at a couple of months, maybe uh, still a year. And I hope that in the third phase, which will take us into the question, what can we take away? So that's the phase of, let's say, a strategic analysis of what this um, crisis situation can also actually do good for the future, where we did have to, let's say, free innovation potentials, uh, which are now um, starting to be seen and which are starting to be perceived and which we can uh, take into the future. So this will be a phase in which we start to question our current ways and the past ways, in which we try to realign higher education in the light of this new experience. And I would like to invite all of you to form part of this community, actually, wherever you are working in your own institution or in your own country, your region, in your policy context. Let's think about how can we use this crisis as sad as it is for many of us, actually, and as uh, terrible and awful, but how can we also use this crisis to be a part in time and history in 2020 to start thinking about the future and what can we learn? And one learning for sure is that uh, few, not just that we need to, to think about different delivery modes, that we also need to think about um, what actually do we teach our students? because we can see in this crisis more than ever that um, creativity, um, that finding ways of dealing, coping with uh, environmental challenges um, which are coming to us through external factors uh, are an enormous, enormous important um, uh, asset which students, which are going to be those who are shaping the future, taking the decision of the future uh, need to learn about and how can in higher education we, us, be the place where students can learn about this future to deal and cope with these questions. In the light of the magnitude of changes, we often have a reflex and that's the freeze reflex. We are standing still. But still, what I think we need to, to start, not just today, we need to start uh, any immediately is uh, to change, to think about how can this uh, inform our mindset for the future. Um, the question is, how can we move from talking about it, which we do more and more now, and um, in the associations which we are um, uh, representing, for example, in Eurasi, the European Association for Institutes of Higher Education, which is representing PhD, professional higher education institutions throughout Europe, uh, rector's conference in this field throughout Europe, uh, universities of applied science throughout Europe. In these institutions uh, and in Eurasi, we are starting to build up fora, to build up communities and networks where we are starting to bring people together to talk about this actually, to talk about um, our ways of structured response, phase two, but also 
uh, the phase of strategic response for the future uh, and how to carry over innovation into higher education, having learned out of this crisis, actually. So how can we come from talking about it to firm actions? And uh, what we can see is that there is a parallel, actually, a parallel to technology. We have talked about technology usage and digital transformation in higher education for the past 20, 30 years, actually, in some parts, in distance education. And what we can see there is actually that we are now having to change, that we are uh, facing a changing master narrative, actually. We are um, changing the master narrative from using technology to uh, teach in higher education to discussing the future of the university. And the corona crisis is even accelerating this process of thinking about the future of the university. Of course, we are starting to, we, we are not, we are, of course, we are not questioning the position of the university in our society. It's the oldest uh, institution which we have in Europe, and it's the most stable institution which we have in Europe, apart from the church. But still, the way we are working, this is something we can question a lot. And still, the assumption that students need to come together in one place physically, learn in the same speed, the same things at the same time, and be tested in the same way, the same stuff, this is something which which can be challenged, of course, now, and the master narrative uh, will change. We know that <clears throat> crises have also been uh, always in history um, a place in which uh, technology advancement was accelerated, and at the same time, technology um, uh, led to uh, often led in, in, in history uh, to uh, more prosperous uh, societies which again uh, allowed themselves and could build up better education systems, which again led to, um, <clears throat> which again led to uh, the ability to advance technology. And so <clears throat> uh, Katz and uh, Golden are describing this in their Harvard uh, book very, very nicely in the study. They studied American history of the last 200 years about that, and they were trying to find out uh, what is always actually in the forefront, and they were saying that when technology is in the forefront, um, usually uh, societies are suffering a little bit, you know, and the Industrial Revolution periods, these are uh, th those uh, phases. And then when uh, education comes into the forward, the prosperity of societies uh, are, uh, so to speak, visible. And again, today, of course, uh, with technology, we can see that um, the internet is actually taking up so much revolutionary um, uh, advancements and processes that um, we believe that we are moving again into a phase in which technology takes over. And we can see that uh, maybe not in terms which we would like to use to describe social pain, but uh, we can see that in many, many other disruptions actually, in the way that we are starting now to negotiate, what does it mean actually, the internet, uh, digital um, uh, privacy, uh, data privacy. These are all things where we can see that we are, ex as humans, are exposed to something we are not used to deal with. And uh, this is something we first need to uh, come to terms with. Uh, another view on this kind of development is uh, one of my uh, very, very dear, actually favorite colleagues, sociologist Dirk Becker from the a university in the north of, of, of Germany, and he is viewing the, the de technological development um, uh, through, through a lens and, and an, an analysis grid, which he calls media epochs. He's thinking about media epochs, and he thinks that uh, we are moving through media epochs. Uh, first media epoch was when we went uh, from oral to literal um, uh, conversations with each other, interactions with each, other, which, uh, with each other. And then from literal uh, to book printing with each other. And then uh, from book printing now to the internet and uh, to digital technologies. And he's saying that always in these phases, uh, when people started to use language, then when they wrote this language down, then they, when they um, could 
so to speak, massify written language in form of book, book print was invented. These were always thresholds over which societies went um, and directly afterwards did not have the slightest notion of an idea how to deal with this, what he calls overload of communication possibilities. These are always overloads. Suddenly, when we could write down things, we could fix history and we could fix cultural heritage and we could take it on a piece of paper or a piece of clay and could give it somewhere else. It could travel somehow, you know, some, suddenly it could travel. And these are um, exactly the same processes he's convinced which we are looking now at and we need to learn to deal with it. And looking at this media epochal um, thinking of uh, the world's progress, we can see that uh, when it comes to digital technology, we are not yet very far advanced, actually. We are in the begin or in the middle. And for COVID-19 situation, I have already uh, introduced that I think we are in the middle of the uh, response phase to that, and we are moving towards a strategic response phase uh, in some months, probably. And the question is what will stay. And it's also a question where we need to ask ourselves actually, how can we get away from, when it comes to higher education at least, how can we get away from a language of deficit when we talk about digital and online learning? Online learning is not a deficiency um, uh, form of learning. Online learning uh, is, if it's done in the right way, a very, very artful doing of weaving didactical pedagogical interactions which are very meaningful for students and which can uh, individualize and personalize learning in a very, really beautiful way and where we can move away from this paradigm of everyone with the same size has to fit in the same uh, model and uh, so to speak classroom. Yeah, what we are talking about, actually, when we talk about the future, is this issue of emergence. And emergence, it's very easy to explain. It's the situation in which we cannot predict the future from knowing the past. So there's no linear way, and COVID is actually uh, a situation in which makes it very clear that we are in the future probably more and more exposed to emergent um, um, situations where we do not know how our systems, which we have developed and shaped in our societies, education systems, industrial systems, uh, economic systems, uh, family systems, how they can actually cope. Uh, and we need to prepare young people for this emergence. The idea behind this preparation of young people is an idea which is not new, actually. Um, it's called VUCA. VUCA standing for volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, uh, and complexity. Uh, most of you know this, and the question is, how can this idea of VUCA be taken to conceptualize uh, our response in higher education to a, a world which is more and more drifting towards emergent behavior? The idea of emergence is self-organization. Systems are self-organizing themselves without external influence, from within actually. Yeah? From which position do we look at the challenge to design higher education? Do we look at higher education from a position in which we think we need to find ways to cope with this or to react? Or do we rather look forward and we're saying, no, we need to design higher education to prepare students for the future. And of course, it is possible to prepare students for in dealing with emergent situation. Yeah, to summarize it, actually, the context of what we are looking at when we think about future skills is a little bit put into this image which we would like to uh, give to you. If you try to blow up an air raft in a very, very narrow box, it's not going to work. Uh, and 
Um, even in today's exponentially changing and shifting world, we still have the tendency uh, to approach the very idea of the future as a static, preordained process that we accept as an inevitable uh, uh, consequence of our past and present. So that we have to overcome this uh, in order um, to get away uh, with situations uh, like this and to think about future skills. Now we have some time for questions. I don't know, um, Patricia, if you are uh, in the chat following questions, uh, I'm going to look at. Um, yes, there's one question from, from Lucien Bollert. Um, what is your definition of skill next to competence? just to make sure that we understand each other. Yeah, I'm going to come to that. And we have, of course, also uh, written in our book extensively about that. Um, we are using the term skill and competence synonymously here. Um, it's a combination of um, uh, knowledge, skills, and uh, attitudes. And we are using the concept which we call action competence, which uh, is actually um, a composition or let's say a concept uh, which is asking the question how can students be supported to develop the ability to uh, act competently successfully uh, in situations which they were not yet prepared for and which in which they have to deal with comp complex uh, problems. Do we have another question Patricia? Yes. We have um, Frank Schulte is asking, isn't the idea of implementing a self-sustaining systematic quality management in education, which is not so young, already one possible approach to react to VUCA? Um, uh, Lucien, I, I'm, I'm sure you would love this question as well, don't you? <laughs> Lucien has written extensively about quality education, quality management. Uh, Frank, yes, uh, only if you uh, embed innovation into your quality management system as an integral characteristics, you can have the most beautiful quality management system, which is steering you completely um, aside and away from innovation. And you think, wow, we are managing in uh, the, the, the boundaries of our criteria and of our uh, indicators which we have used uh, in the most beautiful way. But these indicators do not match. And that's the big difficulty, I think, to form quality management systems which are open to the outside, actually, which are exposing themselves and the higher education institutions to the outside, and which are thinking to form quality in a way that they are exposing the the ideas which you have in higher education to the outside world. And then to ask what is the response from there. Patricia, and one more question or should we continue and take more questions later? Um, I think we can have, we can just uh, answer to one more, which is um, Alicia Leonor Sauli Miklavcic. How can we approach future skills management in enterprises as well as in PhD institutions? Ah, that's a very, very good question. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, Alicia, um, much of our study, which we were doing actually, uh, is done in a way, and I will show you this in the, in the next, uh, in the next uh, chapter, uh, by going into uh, private enterprises and asking them, what do you think uh, future graduates need to be prepared in order to be able to work in your future enterprise? And we were really, really astonished how creative and how innovative most of these enterprises in which we were, tw about 20 enterprises in which we did interviews, um, and about 130, which we were expert screening, how innovative the ways they were approaching already uh, the, let's say, human resource development, professional development of their uh, organization members. They were already very, very uh, innovative. So I think 
Rather, uh, it will probably, what we probably need is not uh, a transfer from innovation of competence development in higher education to enterprises, but maybe the other way around, or even better, uh, forming partnerships between the world of work and um, the world of academic uh, education in, uh, let's say, eye contact to each other. Thank you for this question, Alicia. Okay. okay. So Frank is, we... Frank is insisting, maybe we can come back to it later, but he wants to know how do we do that? Okay, I see. <laughs> okay. Uh, can, can, you, can you note that down? I, I will think yes. about it while speaking. Uh, Frank is always asking uh, complex questions, but, uh, but that's what, what is important, I think. So I would like to uh, come to the next chapter, which is the chapter uh, um, what, I, what, what, what we call future skills in detail. So this is really about what are these future skills? Okay, what are these future skills? And we would like to not just show the list like uh, it is usually or often done, uh, very much to my dismay, I must say, uh, that today, while there are many, many future skills approaches out there available, um, often these are just lists, just listing um, uh, skills uh, which came out of some kind of survey. Uh, and uh, I think it is really important that we, we always understand when we talk about education, we do not talk about, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a natural uh, forced relationship, but we talk about constructs in which we are setting the agenda and which we base on certain philosophical um, ideas and concepts. And when it comes to future skills and the, the envisioning the university of the future, this is exactly the same thing. And we need to explicitize our thinking. We need to explicitize the models. We need to explicitize our philosophical, uh, let's say, assumptions which we are basing that on. Um, so, uh, we would like to show you a little bit about the uh, future skills. And we already said that you can download everything. Uh, there's not just the three books, uh, one of them, unfortunately, only in German. But there's also um, a 60-page report from last year, uh, 2019, uh, which is an international Delphi survey, which we call the Future Skills Report. It's here listed, uh, listed in, in this image as well to download. There are many future skill approaches uh, available. I think we found in our research 47 different approaches. Um, and what we did actually is, we were um, uh, creating an inventory of skills. Uh, so that was done in a way that we compiled all skills which we found uh, in these 47 different approaches. Uh, we paraphrased them, we deleted doubles, and in the end we came to a list of skills which you can see here and find also in the book. This is just a, a an excerpt, uh, a small excerpt uh, of this uh, list of skills. Uh, and then we tried to um, take uh, those future skill approaches, which we are uh, believing are uh, comprehensive educational approaches. Um, they all have different names. And you can see here we took the OECD future skills framework, the PISA key competence framework, European Commission Future um, Education, OECD Key Competencies, OECD Global Competencies, World Economic Forum, 21st Century Skills, and so on. Uh, and we try to uh, map which skills are actually uh, in which approach. And also, uh, in the end, the very last one is our future skills approach. Um, which you can uh, see here. And we try to make a mapping and try to also find which uh, competencies, uh, which skills are actually um, used more often and uh, which are used uh, rather rarely. Um, 
What we found is that often future skill approaches are focused on digital literacy or special liter literacy, for example, uh, financial literacy is, is uh, special literacy. Um, often we found that they have a strong alignment with employability, especially OECD, World Economic Forum, are very, very strongly aligned to that. UNESCO is more living together uh, and so on. But um, there's a strong link to economic utilitaristic uh, thinking often. Um, usually they are not empirically validated. Uh, that's also uh, at least um, uh, an expectation which we try to fulfill with the, with the work we are doing. Uh, and uh, usually they are not rooted in education theory or competence concept. Um, uh, in our next skills studies, I uh, told you already that there are several studies, not just one study, uh, which are resulting into the future skills framework. In our next skills studies, uh, we so far um, did uh, a number uh, of steps. Uh, one is that we were starting uh, four years ago by um, calling for uh, concepts, issuing a call for concepts uh, of competence development in organizations. 140 organizations responded from Germany, um, some multinational organizations, some German, uh, some interregional organizations, uh, and we were starting to um, uh, assemble um, expert groups and uh, conduct screenings of the concepts which they were sending in and we were uh, trying to shortlist 25 of those organizations in which we were finding they had a real advanced thinking uh, of competence development for the future. They had a real, real advanced uh, tool set and experience of future skills. Our reasoning was that we thought, if we want to talk about future skills, what are the future, the most advanced skills, the ways of dealing with the future in terms of qualification skills, competencies, learning? Uh, we need to find those places in which the thinking and the conceptualization of this is very, very advanced. And we need to go there, like going into future laboratories, looking at that and learning from their thinking. We went into that, we did a short list then in the end of 18, 17 uh, different organizations. We went into these organizations over several months uh, and we were interviewing staff there, responsible staff, HR managers, CEOs, uh, and so on, uh, uh, leaders of the organizations. Uh, and then we created a skill inventory a long list, uh, a huge, huge map of future skills. Uh, and while doing that, we were noticing that people were not just talking about future skills, they were also starting to talk about how do future organizations need to look like. And if future organizations look like this, what does it mean for higher education, for students, for graduates? How do they need to be educated in order to help these future organizations to sustain themselves and to develop themselves? How, what does it mean actually? And they were also talking about leadership concepts. They were thinking and saying and ex ex expressing with the old thinking of leadership, we are not going to go into the new future. And of course, this is something which is uh, uh, almost too banal to say it, but <laughs> But uh, when you when you are going into today's organizations and you see the creativity they have there, often at least, not always, but often, uh, and what you can really learn from that, um, uh, it is uh, quite amazing. We took then this skill inventory and we were starting um, to draft a Delphi survey. And we were conducting a Delphi survey, international Delphi survey with 50 experts in two rounds from uh, all over the world, actually. And we were asking them, uh, how would you phrase these future skill formulations? Because we were formulating future skill proposals in a way. Uh, and the experts were responding and they were rephrasing them. They were uh, validating them. 
And then in the next uh, uh, Delphi round, we were asking the expert, so if these are your future skills, what do you think? How well is higher education actually doing? And we took the results and we documented them in our books and uh, in the documents which we are um, offering you for download uh, and the publications. Um, this is the design actually of the entire um, next skills uh, study. You can see at the 17 in-depth interviews, then the Delphi study, uh, two Delphi studies, uh, and the expert screening. This is the design of the two rounds of Delphi surveys. Uh, the first round you can see here in the bottom uh, had the uh, at, uh, intention to clarify concepts uh, and to ask um, also experts, how probable would you think that this kind of future skill will become important uh, for organizations in the future? And then also uh, we were uh, asking time um, estimates on time to um, uh, impact uh, from uh, higher education institutions readiness. So what do you think, when will these skills become um, important, will become relevant for higher education institutions? These are our 17 uh, future skill profiles. Uh, we are calling them profiles, future skill profiles, because um, each of these profiles are in itself containing uh, a set of competencies. Uh, and they are, so to speak, containers for uh, competencies, which you can also uh, find in the documentation. Um, and all together, they are creating the map of future skills, which we are, um, which our studies uh, are resulting in. We were trying to understand, is there actually a structure in between? And we were, after many, many attempts of structuring this future skills, um, seeing that there was actually a threefold uh, structure which we could apply to this uh, set of 17 skills. And this threefold structure is actually um, originating from educational thinking. Um, education in our understanding is always uh, a process in which we are building relations between ourselves and the world. So we have the subjective dimension in educational processes, in learning and educational processes. That's the I. Uh, but it, it is at the same time, education is also a process of developing uh, the relation between ourselves and an object. For example, a subject in school, mathematics or physics, uh, or a task which we have to perform. And at the same time also, it is the process of developing the relation between ourselves and the world, the social world, the organizational world. And so we were, uh, uh, so to speak, dimensioning the future skills dimensions and shaping them into a subjective dimension, which is looking into how the individual is asked to perform things in the future. That's the subjective dimension. And future skills which are dealing with this subjective dimension went into this box. We were also at the same time looking at the objective dimension, which is the dimension looking at uh, performance with tasks, with disciplines, um, shaping disciplines, shaping tasks, shaping, uh, so to speak, work, which has to be done, work tasks. Um, and we were looking at our future skills uh, and we were, uh, so to speak, allocating those which are primarily uh, concerned with uh, performing tasks in, in this box. And the same with world, with the what we call individual organization related skills. 
And here you can find this allocation in a nice way uh, visualized. Uh, we can see that there are skills like autonomous learning competence, personal agility, self-efficacy, self-management, self-initiative, autonomy, tolerance for ambiguity, need or motivation for achievement, ability to reflect, which are um, forming the subjective uh, dimension. Then we have, of course, digital literacy, which is an important skill. We have, of course, uh, creativity. We have agility. We have this future mindset orientation, which is already the world of work. We have uh, sense making, which is so important. I just talked about it with somebody else today. Um, sense making in an emergent world is one of the key competencies, actually. If you are constantly set in different environments, which are constantly self-organized changing, you need this developed ability to make sense out of this um, uh, context. Um, and then we have cooperation competence and communication competence. And you see that probably for you there are many familiar ones, but maybe also uh, some which you would rather feel funny about, maybe about the formulation. Uh, and uh, we were, so to speak, taking uh, the liberty a little bit for formulating um, container um, uh, skill labels. Uh, which are then in itself again containing other futures, other other skills, which are consisting of of other skills. Um, yeah. Now, uh, asking a question to you, actually, think about your own, the teachers of you. Think about your own classroom uh, as a student. Uh, think about uh, yourself as a professional learner or think about as yourself as a student also. Uh, and now look at these uh, skills which we have listed here uh, and think about which skills make a, so to speak, a mental game for yourself. Which are the skills in which I am already quite educated, where I feel actually quite familiar, where me for myself, I would say, yeah, this is actually something where I have already developed quite a uh, competence, quite a professional competence, maybe. Uh, and you can also think a little bit about what was the real threshold which brought me there? What was this, what we call the threshold experience, which I had to go over, which I had to cross in order to develop this? What made me really learning literate, really self-efficient, really self-determined, really self-competent? What gave me my sense of ethical conviction? Um, well, how, how did I become an innovative person? Am I an innovative person? Think about it. And then now we would like to share again a, a poll with you, uh, which I think is this one. No, it's uh, this one. Um, oh, it is this, this one, yeah. We've just uh, actually by uh, random, randomly uh, selected 10 of the 17 competence profiles. And we would like to ask you which future skills um, would you like to explore in your classroom, be it as a student, a professional learner, or a teacher? Let's go. Tell us. I think everybody can choose one. I'm not sure, actually. Maybe it's possible to choose more than one. I'm not sure. We've just chosen 10. And the reason was that Zoom is not allowing for more than 10. <laughs> Which is a pity, of course, but um, that's okay. 
and everybody is uh, just uh, forced to choose one actually uh, and we have now 75 persons which have taken the survey maybe we wait until 90 some of you probably need to read through it and really think about what does it mean tolerance for ambiguity okay uh, we have 80 now and it's slowing down a little bit so i think that maybe 81 82 83 maybe i'm going to stop the poll here uh -huh, of 109 and i'll show you results so number one is uh, creativity actually with 21 percent saying creativity i would like to explore more future mindset 19 percent um, and creativity together make up 40 percent and then we have autonomous learning competence and sense making and tolerance for ambiguity yeah so that's uh, that's quite interesting thank you very much um, as i said you can download these future skill profiles here uh, and uh, have a look at it each future skill profile is coming uh, with a definition uh, with a description of why it is relevant uh, with a description of which competencies are uh, sub-competencies uh, and uh, with some literature uh, in which uh, they are defined. To round the picture a little bit, we believe that of course action uh, is not, cannot be separated. Action is actually an interplay uh, always between these three dimensions. And what I know about myself when in education I develop the relation to myself will always influence my view, outlook and ability which I have to deal with certain objects. And this again is interrelated with my uh, ability and the relation which I have with my social uh, world. So these three dimensions are actually interrelated. And that's why we developed this triple helix idea in which we are saying um, um, in the future organization um, students graduates members of organizations of our society actually will have to act in highly complex situations for which they which they cannot be trained just through through knowledge transmission they need to be trained to really act in a competent way and a competent way to act in the future acting in a highly emergent context in the future consists actually of abilities of skills in the three different categories dealing with the social world myself and an object so this has to be combined the competence to act in future unknown and highly emergent professional and private contexts is a result of combining interdependent skills in these three areas. We are currently building a skill map and a skill finder so you that on the web you can click on a skill and then you can find the definition and the description but also in the future good practice how to implement this actually in uh, our organizations and now i come again to the end and before i go back to patricia and ask uh, about the questions which have maybe been asked i would like to uh, challenge all of us to do a 60 second relaxation i'm going to take my uh, watch okay and start the timer um, the idea is let's freely associate together use the chat window to, for that chat your put your uh, uh, associate words into the chat we're going to have 60 seconds let's all look at the chat let's be visionary colorful and experimental so go to the chat and type into the chat window what do you think about when you hear the term future skills? What do you think about when you hear the term future skills? Write into the chat the first term you think about. Read what others write.
Let's go. 60 seconds. Time is running. <laughs> About time. Light. Very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. That was 60 seconds of free associating. Super. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. I don't know if you had the chance to really look at it, but from this association, you can already see from which different corners we approach this subject. For some of you, it is dealing with advancing society. For some of you, of you it's dealing uh, future skills should result into graduates which are advancing our economy. And maybe both can go together and is not excluded mutually. But what needs to be created is actually a dialogue of those um, two or three or four different stakeholder groups coming to a table. And we need this dialogue. And that's, again, something which I had said at the beginning, uh, Yurashi and um, uh, the, the institutions. It stands for the Rector's Conferences, the Professional Higher Education Institutions. Uh, we really need to engage into a dialogue about the future. We are the universities. It is not somebody else. We are the universities. We make the universities. The universities are self-governed, largely self-governed entities. And we need to create the future. We need to participate in this, in this exercise. I'm at the end of my chapter about future skills now. And I would like to ask again, um, Patricia, do we have some questions which we can take? Let's say three or four questions. Okay, we have nine. Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, there's one question from Ghazi Asasa, uh, who wants to know, one important ingredient of education is assessment. Can you elaborate on the future of e-assessment in different sectors, e.g. health, applied sciences, It's on e-assessment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think that uh, that's uh, still a big question, of course, how to assess and how to think about. I mean, we are today coming together to think about future skills. So the question is really, um, do we want to talk about um, how to bring the assessment concepts which we have today into the reality of the digital room. Uh, maybe we really need to think about a radical way of reforming assessment. Um, a bachelor student today has 28 or 25 modules in three or four years of his bachelor student uh, uh, um, uh, studies. For each module, which is five ECTS minimum, he has a, he or she has a one, one assessment actually. So, in three years, six semesters, you have about 30 exams. That's five per semester. That's quite a lot, actually. And the practice is that these module exams are split up into three, two or three units. So that doubles or triples even. And in my view, what we need is we need to cut down exams by uh, more than 50%. We need to come to eight exams, which are oral, which are written, which are practical which are really getting students into reasoning. And this is a completely different attitude, I think. And some of that can be maybe uh, digital, and some of that can be 
uh, also or has to be then also in a let's say live interaction. Okay, there was another question that is yeah. maybe a bit related to what you just said, which is not e-assessment but e-learning and how it can be um, the, how what can one adequately develop advanced social skills in an online environment maybe this can relate so we can skip this question uh, that's uh, yeah that, but uh, sorry yeah or do you want to answer yeah i want to answer because okay. uh, there, there is a big misconception about e-learning e-learning and we all have our mental images about e-learning uh, some of us have the mental image about e-learning that e-learning is just a logistic different way of distributing learning materials. So that means we're using digital infrastructure to transfer the slides, the knowledge, the whatever lectures on video to our students. Um, and some of us have totally different images, uh, mental images, uh, and, and, and think that e-learning actually is a way to engage students into interactions which are not possible in the classroom. And when you think about e-learning in this way, to engage students into interactions which are not possible, then you start to think about e-learning as a means to individualize and to personalize learning. And personalizing and individualizing learning, that's exactly the pathway to future skills and competence development. Okay, we have another question from Katalin Sondi. I find it very difficult to make students understand how important future skills are. Are there any initiatives to start raising awareness in schools? In, in my case, they often come from very traditional uh, settings in schools. Um, you are right. Uh, I think uh, just I, I have two, two, two answers in my head. One is um, think about different terms don't call it future skills call it differently think about terms which are engaging and involving students which they think yeah that that is actually cool that we should learn that actually yeah we should learn to convince somebody of course yeah we should be learning to be uh, and so on and and the second one is uh future skills also asked asks for changing education higher education or school education uh, and that's always difficult uh, to change paradigms. Um, and uh, that's why I think uh, we need to work more on showing good examples. And that's in my research group, actually, in the next, next education uh, group, it's called Next Education. In, in my research group, we are actually working on this issue now. We are thinking about how to develop uh, educational concepts which are and finding them also because they are already out there and highlighting them and making them available. Okay, I want to try to, uh, to answer two questions. Um, to two questions now. The first one, are some of the 70 skills hierarchical? Mm -hmm. uh, so do you need one to access others? And the other question is maybe linked to it. Um, where do you see links and differences between the 70 future skills profiles and the 50 key competences of the EU Entrecom framework? On a quick review, it seems that they are, there are many similarities. Yeah, that's also uh, very, very important. I mean, um, while I think that there are, um, that there are, similarities, there are also differences. Uh, I think what, what is important to understand is that the future skills work which we do, or the DigiComEDU framework, or, or, or whatever else you take, and, and I showed you this uh, analysis of different future skill uh, concepts. I think what is important to understand is we all are not inventing the concept of competence or skill in a new way. We are not initiatives which are developing skills, understandings or concepts. We are compiling ideas 
of how and which skills should be selected for the future. And if you think about that and you ask yourself, um, how did they do that actually, these different initiatives? How did they come to their understanding of the future, to the profile of selecting competencies which for the future are important? And secondly, how did they actually compose a framework which uh, gives a holistic understanding of an educational idea behind it? Uh, then I think you can start to find the differences there. But of course, we all want that future graduates are going to be digitally literate, of course. Uh, some of the frameworks even are also emphasizing ethical competence. Some others are even emphasizing um, self-determined learning competencies. But then look at the specificities and look at the uh, intentions of these frameworks and you will find differences. And the very, very ultimate goal of the framework which we have created is to equip students to deal with unforeseen complex problems in the future world. Um, and uh, it is our intention to uh, outline what are the steps which they can do in order to arrive there. Okay, there are some questions left, but we only uh, we only have ten minutes left. So, okay. do you so, want to so, go ahead with your presentation yeah, or I'm with questions? Go, no, I'm going to go ahead with the presentation. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip, skip one chapter that is chapter four. That's about um, underlying structures and the theory behind the future skill model, uh, because I felt that now with the short time we have left we should rather look a little bit about higher education. Uh, just some slides about it. What we did was very interesting, but not very significant in terms of research. We were in the Delphi survey asking the 50 experts from all over the world, so look at these competencies, these 17 competencies, and you can see them here um, uh, separated into the three dimensions. Look at these 17 competencies and tell us how important do you think they are for higher education on a scale from one to five. And then tell us, secondly, how well do you think higher education is doing? And since we ask such a diverse group of uh, people, of experts coming from different countries, different regions of, the, I think even all different regions of the world, um, uh, also from different positions, some teachers, some policy makers, some institutional leaders, some researchers. Uh, this is not significant for Europe or for Germany or for one higher education uh, sector. Absolutely not. But on the overall, we can all ask ourselves, looking at these results, what is actually our estimate of how well do we do? And you can see here that uh, the light blue uh, um, bars represent the estimation of how well higher education is doing, whereas the dark blue bars are representing the uh, answers which were estimating how important the different skills were. So you can see that there is always a big gap, and that's across the board, of course, uh, and that's uh, where we were starting to think that probably the skills which we were selecting when they are important and not yet implemented in higher education. And again, that's just an average. It's something we really have to work on more to find methods and um, uh, measures to diagnose higher education institutions, to help them also to find maturity models um, and, and, and progression models. Um, but you can see here that, of course, it's quite relevant to have, the, to have a look at these answers and to see that across the board, um, higher education experts are thinking that these different future skills are important and relevant, but are, you, are not yet uh, uh, reached uh, uh, far enough in higher education. 
The last section I would like to talk about for, let's say, three, four minutes, and then we can also end uh, our seminar, our masterclass today with some, uh, some questions, uh, is the question, how will higher education develop? And uh, in our um, research, we identified what we call the 10 seconds uh, of higher education. The 10 seconds are the 10 drivers of higher education for the future. Uh, you can look at the research which has been compiled in the, uh, in the book publications. And we were developing from there four scenarios. And these four scenarios for future higher education again went to the experts and the experts were assessing the validity, the plausibility and also the time for uh, which it will take until when they become relevant. Um, and what you see here is um, the uh, time estimation of experts. They were saying that these four, these four components of a vision of the future higher education uh, institutions uh, carry different notions of radical, let's say, change. Uh, and that's why also they will probably take different time frames until they become really uh, alive uh, in higher education. But what you can see here is that three of them at least have a focus point uh, on about 10 years uh, estimation. Uh, one is called the Future Skills University Scenario, which is not just what we talk about uh, now, it is really a radical turn, turn away from knowledge transmission, turn to competence development. And competence is not something excluding knowledge, it's including knowledge, but it's a knowledge plus concept. And we need to work on this plus. We need to bring higher education, teaching and learning into the trajectory of this plus knowledge plus of competence. That's very, very important. That's the first scenario. The second scenario is the ne networked multi-institutional study scenario. Today, students are enrolling in University A and they are uh, graduating from University A. In the future, students will enroll in University A and then will embark on a journey, a learning journey through institutions, through schools, through faculty. And we need to make that happen. Tomorrow we have a webinar on micro-credentials. Micro-credentials, uh, I think at the same time, uh, are actually um, the methodology which we need to uh, allow this network multi-institutional study scenario. The third scenario is the My University scenario. It is the scenario in which students are enrolling and are not presented with a ready-made curriculum they are presented with a choice. They are presented with the question, what are you interested in? How can we help you? They are coached through a phase of curriculum building, which is then validated with experts and teachers. It's not a blind study, it's an informed personal study. And that's where we need to go for the future. And only digital technology will allow this actually, because the individualization process, which is underlying this scenario, can only be supported through digital technology in a meaningful way, not through brick and mortar institutions. And the fourth scenario is the lifelong learning, higher, higher learning scenario, which is a scenario which is turning around the understanding of our higher education scenario today. Today, we think that bachelor and master is the focal point of academic education and afterwards academic education is phasing out. In the future, what we are going to look at is a preliminary academic phase uh, of allowing students to enter um, uh, their work phase and then an increasing, an increasing trajectory of academic education throughout the journey which they take the biographical education, episodical journey um, throughout their life. So these are the four scenarios. And what we can say now is good practices are actually very, very much in demand. Um, 
And what would be really, really beautiful, and I'm sure that everybody of you has their favorite scenario, their favorite university, their favorite school, which they know. If you have this, a website, a literature link, a person, a name, please send it to us through the chat or through email. Send it to us, share it with us. We will compile this list and we will share it back as part of the slide deck with everybody uh, here uh, in our group, in our still large group, actually. Yeah, the finishing line, actually, and we need to finish on time, is uh, to look at some, some quotes. Uh, and um, I think one of the really, really nice and expressive quotes of Ivan Toffler is putting it uh, into a good light. Uh, he's saying, in a time of exploding change, asking the very largest of questions about our future is not merely a matter of intellectual curiosity, it is a matter of survival. Thank you very much for your attention. And Patricia, I think we have time for one more question, maybe. Yes, right. <laughs> so um, maybe we can try to... Uh, combine two questions again, which is a question regarding how to cope with differences uh, between communities or between countries, for example, low resources communities or differences between different countries in Europe, how to cope with these regarding future skills. Yeah, I think that uh, the matter of coping with differences is uh, super important. It's a matter of uh, social inclusion. And what we know today is that social inclusion is not the opposite of excellence. Social inclusion um, is the concept which is um, the stage on which excellence can grow, actually. Uh, and we have so many examples, so many examples of people coming from all walks and kinds of lives and situations, which are today leading figures and opinion leaders, stimulating our societies and economy. And we need to deal with differences and diversity in a way in which we are embracing diversity and differences uh, so that we all can learn from each other because our different, mutually different perspectives are those which we need to have a clear view on this world. I think that's it, right? We have no more time. We need to stop because uh, another webinar is coming up here um, from Yurashi. Uh, you are all invited to stay, of course. Um, uh, on behalf of Yurashi, as the Vice President of Yurashi, I would like to thank you for your attendance. I would like to thank Patricia Bonoro for moderating. You have been a wonderful moderator. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. I would like to um, thank also Dovile and uh, Francesca for their organization and for making this actually uh, possible. I uh, would like to thank Yurashi for allowing the space this Actually, today should have been our annual conference. We didn't make it due to Corona, but I think we could share some wonderful time. Um, we are going. We have moved the conference, so you will be able to attend the conference hopefully uh, in winter 2020, uh, and then uh, we can maybe have an opportunity to meet face to face. So thank you very much. We are now off, switching off pulling the plug and wish you a nice afternoon.